Peggy Ian of Harris with a scandal in Jackson cabinet regarding Margaret O'Neill Ian and Jackson's secretary of war, John Ian. Margaret O'Neill was the daughter of William O'Neill, who owned a tavern major Ian often boarded at. At the time, she was married to John B. Timberlake, but he committed suicide while fighting in the U.S. Navy. It was then that Major Ian felt the need to marry the newly widowed Mrs. Timberlake and take in her two children. When they moved to Washington, many cabinet members and their wives protested against their presence in the Capitol, claiming she was indecent. Jackson also received many letters and protests to her arrival. In a letter to Reverend Dr. Eli, he began, Your confidential letter of the 18th instant has been received in the same spirit of kindness and friendship with which it was written. Reverend Dr. Eli was an old mercantile friend of Jackson and was a supporter of Jackson's administration in hope that Jacksonian democracy would bring about a union of the church and state. Eli wrote to Jackson detailing the charges about Peggy Eaton that he had heard from Reverend J. N. Campbell, who was Jackson's minister. The rumors included how Mrs. Eaton had had a bad reputation at the tavern, which had only grown when she had a miscarriage while her husband was away at sea, and how her servants were told to call her children Eaton and not Timberlake. He said, For your sake, for your dead wife's sake, for the sake of your own, own administration, for the credit of the government and the country, you should not countenance a woman like this. In response to Eli's opposition, there was a series of 17 documents defending Peggy Eaton's innocence against the muzzling that had become the norm since Jackson's election. In his response, he continued, I must here be permitted to remark that I sincerely regret you did not personally name this subject to me before you left Washington, as I could, in that event, have apprised you of the great exertions made by Clay and his partisans here and elsewhere to destroy the character of Mrs. Eaton by the foulest and basest means, so that a deep and lasting wrong might be inflicted on her husband. I could have given you information that would at least have put you on your guard with respect to anonymous letters, containing slanderous insinuation against female character. If this evidence as this has, is to be received, I ask where is the guarantee for female character, however moral, however virtuous. Eli had gone to Jackson's inaugural address, but had not stayed in the Capitol long enough to speak his concerns to the President himself. While Jackson was regretful, his message remained the same, and Mrs. Eaton was the same in Washington. In fact, he believed that Henry Clay was, was responsible for the defamations made against her. History showed that he and Clay were rivals since the election of 1824 and the corrupt bargain that had won John Quincy Adams the presidency. Upon Jackson's inauguration, Clay was removed from his position as Secretary of State due to Jackson's belief in the spoil system. In 1834, Clay started the Whig Party in direct opposition to Jackson, who he viewed as a tyrant. By making clear who his political opponents were, Jackson surrounded himself with people who he, he trusted as he expanded the influence of the executive branch. Jackson also insinuated that letters were an unsafe way of communicating, and that if the letter had fallen into other hands, the issue of over Peggy Ian would have grown. This displays Jackson's defensiveness over the issue and how his inability to protect his wife from public rumors in the past only strengthens his resolve to defend Mrs. Ian against any of those against her. Men who can be base enough to speak thus of the dead are not too good secretly to slam the living, and they deserve, and no doubt will receive, the scorn of all good men. Mr. Eaton had been known to me for twenty years. His character heretofore, for honesty and morality, has been unblemished, and I, for the first time, to change my opinion of him because of the slams of the city. We know, here, that none are spared. Even Mrs. Madison was assailed by these fiends in human shape. Mrs. Commodore has been, also been singled out as a victim to the peace actress and alter of defamation. Two Jackson relationships had great importance in his life. Since the tragedies of losing his mother, father, and two brothers as a child, Jackson closely held on to his personal relationships as an adult. As with his wife, Rachel, Jackson was very loyal to Mr. Ian. He still stands against his friend's wife as a parallel to his own experience with the muzzling against Rachel. By clearly stating the flaws of the capital, Jackson made his poor upbringing and his scathing opinion of the nation's capital blatant. In his mind, there was no one who would be safe from the rumors that circled the Capitol. The wife of the fourth president and one of the most beloved first ladies in America, Dolly Madison, had been rumored of to be sexually insatiable and an adulterer due to her low cut gowns that the public deemed provoking. On the other hand, Commodore, favorite reporter of the U.S. Navy fighting in Mexico, was notified of his wife's alleged infidelity, a letter saying that she had eloped with her own nephew disguised as a Negro, along with many other letters with more vicious rumors. The corrupt elite became a common thread among the political figures as people closest to them were continually slammed with false accusations. As Jackson's hatred toward the capital woman grew stronger, his political opponents became clearer. When Mrs. E. visits me, I shall treat her with as much politeness as I have ever done, believing her virtuous, at least as much so as the female who first gave rise to the foul tale, and as many of those who introduce her. As to, as to the determination of the ladies in Washington, I have nothing, nor will I ever have anything to do with it. I will not persuade her or dissuade any of them from visiting Mrs. Eaton, leaving Mrs. Eaton and them to settle the matter of the, in their own way. But I am told that many of the ladies here have waited on her. 
Like Rachel Jackson, Peggy Eaton was ostracized in the White House. Rising from humble beginnings as Jackson had, Mrs. Eaton fell out of place among the elite women of the Capitol, especially by the wives of Vice Presidents John C. Calhoun and the three cabinet secretaries, Barry and Branch and Ingham. Florida Calhoun grew a vicious circle of anti-Peg supporters, even including Emily Donaldson, the acting first lady who was the wife of Rachel's nephew. While Jackson said he would not involve himself in the affair of the woman, he took out his anger on his cabinet members who failed to control their wives, which he believed to be the responsibility of the husbands. Taking it upon himself to remove the corruption in the Capitol, he replaced his cabinet members, and by doing so, limited Calhoun's influence and eventually caused Calhoun to resign his position as vice president. By re increasing power in the executive branch, Jackson started an administration that surrounded around his personal goals and emotions, and no slander or otherwise would change his opinion of Miss C and in her innocence. Permit me now, my dear and highly esteemed friend, to conclude this hasty and, I fear, unintelligible to all. Well, so on the one hand, we shall shun base women as a pestilence of the worst and most dangerous kind to society. We ought, on the other hand, to guard f virtuous female character with vestal vigilance. Female virtue is like a tender and delicate flower, let by the breath of suspicion rise upon it, and it withers and perhaps perishes forever. When it shall be assailed by envy and malice, the good and pious will maintain its purity and innocence until guilt is made manifest, not by the rumors and suspicions, but by facts and proofs brought forth and sustained by respectable and fearless witnesses in the face of day. Truth shuns not the light, but falsehood deals in sly and dark insinuations and prefers darkness, because his deeds are evil. This poem says, The liar's tongue we ever hate and banish from our sight. By the end of his letter, Jackson acknowledged the contradiction that while the virtue of women should always be protected, the actions of women should not always be defended, as with the cabinet wives. Jackson would not allow Peggy Eaton's virtue to be lost, and through the letter, he had thoroughly proved the defamation against her false. For being present for the majority of the initial encounters between then Mrs. Timberlake and Mr. Ian, and as a witness for the budding friendship between Mr. Timberlake and Mr. Ian, in his eyes Mrs. Ian's innocence was obvious. He worked endlessly to prove so to others with concrete evidence that could not be rebuffed, even going to ex the extremes of finding Dr. Craven, the physician who had been too late to save Mrs. Ian's baby during a miscarriage. To him, Peggy Ian was a shot at redemption, as he had failed to save his wife from the same voices that had brought upon her death. By exposing the truth with him, behind the Ian's relationship, he got rid of some of the grief and guilt he still held over his late wife. For a man that ruled on passion, Jackson used to Peggy Ian's affair to build the backbone of his administration and choose the men he ran it with.